National Nine News. This is Nightline with Jim Whaley. Government embarrassed over petrol tax admission. New labelling laws to spell out fat and sugar content of food. And the death of political commentator Paul Lyman. Good evening. The government is under renewed pressure over fuel prices following an admission from the country's top Treasury official that Australians are paying more for their petrol as a result of the GST. Treasury Secretary Ted Evans says it's true that as the price of petrol rises, so too does the amount of tax motorists have to pay. While the Prime Minister says he's never denied that, Australia's motoring groups say it's evidence that the government has misled the public over the impact of the GST and should hand the extra taxes back by freezing fuel excise. Laurie Wilson has our report. After a couple of days in the bush, Peter Costello must have been wondering just what all the fuss was about. Warned he'd face a backlash over soaring petrol prices, he was instead given what almost amounted to a hero's welcome. I think you're doing a great job. Not quite so fantastic, though. The continuing problems elsewhere for the government. Over its promise, the price of petrol wouldn't rise as a result of the GST. The nation's top Treasury official, Ted Evans, forced to admit that as the price of petrol goes up, so too does the amount of tax motorists are forced to pay. That's true, isn't it? Yes. Yes, thanks. It may have been obvious, but for a government which has continually ducked and weaved over the issue, it was an embarrassing admission. Mr Evans forced to issue a statement, denying his comments amounted to a concession. It was the GST which was the culprit in pushing up petrol prices. Mr Evans put out a statement this morning saying that the uh, Sydney Morning Herald headline is false, completely false. The headline may be, but not the basic facts, as the Prime Minister was forced to concede. Look, when the price of petrol goes up, you pay more GST. I've, I've, but nobody's ever denied that. Which is precisely the point the government's critics have been making. The Australian Automobile Association renewing its call for the government to offset at least some of the GST impact by scrapping the next increase in fuel excise. The AAA says motorists are already paying an extra three cents a litre in fuel taxes since the introduction of the tax. That will rise another two cents once the planned excise increase goes ahead in February. Laurie Wilson reporting for Nightline. With his government shaken by allegations of vote rigging, Queensland Premier Peter Beattie has made an impassioned plea to ALP members to keep the faith. With two more Labor MPs under suspicion of electoral fraud, Premier Beattie is concerned that the allegations will harm his chances of re-election. The Premier flew in from Japan with a warning for any electoral rorters in government ranks. Anyone who has rorted has got more than Tom Shepherdson to fear. They've got me to fear. The inquiry today lifted the suppression order on two Queensland MPs' names, Woodridge MP and former State Secretary Mike Kaiser and the member for Greenslopes, Gary Fenlon, are now under a cloud, along with Springwood's Grant Musgrove, with former Deputy Premier Jim Elder yet to appear before Shepherdson. Council appeared for Kaiser and Fenlon at today's hearing, rejecting the allegations made against the pair. After a series of high-level meetings to gauge the depth of this crisis, Mr Beattie said he'd wait until public hearings conclude, as the allegations are so far just one-sided. Therefore, it is for me to make an assessment until that's been done. The opposition leader has already made his assessment. And the Labor Party have now been exposed as a, a pack of cheats and rorters. And I think that uh, a great many Queenslanders will feel disappointed and betrayed. With an early election now looming, Peter Beattie is worried too about his re-election chances. And today pitched to the party's rank and file. To stick with us. I need them. I need them to finish the reform to cut out this cancer. Melanie Went for Nightline. We'll soon have a much clearer idea of how much sugar and saturated fat we're eating as a result of new packaging laws agreed to by Australian and New Zealand health ministers. Industry groups and the federal government had opposed the laws, claiming they would result in unnecessary costs. After six years of negotiation, the biggest change to food labelling laws since the 1950s. Everyone understands the old expression, we are what we eat. Well, from today, we'll know what we eat. 
in very fine detail. The new labels will carry precise nutritional information, protein, energy, carbohydrate, salt, as well as saturated fats and sugars. And the labels will also show percentages of main ingredients. In this case, just how much strawberry is in the jam jar. The need for that percentage labelling caused a deep split between state health ministers on one side and an alliance of the food industry and the federal government. The, the value for money, for the cost that is imposed on business, just won't produce um, enough result. Consumers are going to be slugged for the costs of useless information. Mr Hook says what he calls information overload will cost the food industry $400 million and that could increase food prices by 2%. Even so, the Consumers Association says the information is vital. It makes a real difference to their ability to choose good quality products. There's still a bit more work to be done, setting a few minimum standards. For instance, how much cream should actually be in ice cream and how much chocolate should be in chocolate. The hardest part may be still to come. The new details should be finalised early in the new year. Peter Harvey for Nightline. A young Sydney mother has died after being shot in her car while her three-year-old son sat in the back seat. 20-year-old Anita Vizrina's husband, Ahmed Banat, was also seriously injured in the attack which happened late last night in the southwestern suburb of Lakemba. Witnesses say they heard as many as five shots and the sound of a car being chased. The child was not hurt in the shooting and is now in the care of relatives. And an Adelaide man who's been the subject of an intensive police hunt in, since Monday is tonight in custody. Jason Bowen was wanted for questioning over the murder of Peter Hurst in the city's northern suburbs. Police converged on an Adelaide Hills property early this morning after Bowen was spotted by the owner. Tired and hungry after five days on the run, he gave himself up without a fight. Late today, he was charged with murder. There was a major gas scare for a town in Victoria's East today, and the danger is not over yet. Hundreds of people were evacuated from the Mowie area when a bulldozer ruptured a main pipeline. The pipeline has now been closed off a few kilometres up and downstream, but there's still so much LPG inside it, the gas is expected to continue leaking through most of tomorrow. The line was badly ruptured about 3 p.m. by a bulldozer laying fibre optic cable. First police on the scene say the highly flammable gas was initially spurting 100 metres in the air and posed a serious threat. We're taking it fairly seriously at the moment. There's been a large amount of gas escape from the pipeline and we're busy uh, trying to seal the area off. Police set up roadblocks and evacuated about 250 people within a five kilometre radius. They went to an evacuation centre at Moe Tafe to stay overnight. Well over a hundred people all up have been involved at some stage this afternoon and they've worked extremely well together. The pipeline is the major LPG link between the infamous Longford plant and the main processing centre in Hastings. Not only will it take at least another 24 hours to bring this gas leak under control, but the CFA says the damage to the pipeline is so severe it'll take several days, if not longer, to repair. Charles Slade for Nightline. Prime Minister Howard is pressuring the banks to give back some of the profits they've reaped from farmers who now face ruin by flooding in northern New South Wales. This as state and federal governments agreed on a special assistance package for farmers which is expected to be in place within a fortnight. The crisis meeting of politicians, farmers and banks was given a grim picture at the New South Wales Premier's office today. If you look at that map, you look at the red, most of the crop in that red area is gone. Conservative estimates of loss in the hundreds of millions. The Deputy Prime Minister John Anderson remained clearly shocked from his tour of the flood devastated regions. Well, I've never seen such levels of stress written on the faces of the people that I've stood before in meeting after meeting and uh, I'll take it with me to my grave. But perhaps those emotions help the parties jointly agree to a rescue plan within the next fortnight. It'll include unemployment benefits for farming families and non-repayable loans to replant lost crops for next year. The degree of help from the state and federal governments is still unclear. We've agreed that, that restarting the business cycle in this region, this vast region of, of country Australia, is the challenge before us. If we don't get the basis of what we do right in the next couple of weeks, an extraordinary amount of New South Wales agriculture and New South Wales rural communities are going to fall over. In the flood regions, tales of misfortune and some of survival continue. 
The Namoi River encircled Wee War but failed to envelop the town thanks to its levee. Helicopter drops will continue though. This is what Wee War was saved from. Narrabri residents were out cleaning up today, the water having receded. About 40 homes were flooded. And in Pilliga, a town of 150 residents, the local shopkeeper has to drive two hours to bring in milk, bread and beer because the main road to Narrabri and Wee War is cut. And schooling is pretty uncomfortable, with one room of the local primary school crammed with students of all ages. You have the biggest mosquitoes I've ever seen arriving here today in plague proportions. Tomorrow, Prime Minister Howard will see for himself flood-affected areas around Tamworth and Gunnedah, and he'll hear the plight of farmers, which has so moved his deputy. Mark Burrows for Nightline. And now some sad news about a colleague of ours, Paul Lynham, one of Australia's most distinguished journalists and commentators, today lost his battle with cancer at the age of 55. Lynham's award-winning career spanned four decades. Newspaper man, foreign correspondent, author, and more recently, federal political correspondent for this program and 60 Minutes. But as Laurie Oakes reports, there was much more to Paul Lynham, not least his unique interviewing skills, and a dry wit. Paul Lynham's last television appearance was on April 16 on 60 Minutes. Have you ever found yourself in a situation that felt like it was straight out of a movie? Reporting with characteristic courage and humour his own illness. For example, the one where the very serious doctor says to the patient, I'm sorry to tell you, but that shadow on your x-ray is cancer and you're now fighting for your life. Paul lost that fight at four o'clock this afternoon in a Canberra private hospital. I was really sorry to hear about Paul's death. He was a great journalist. He was witty, intelligent, and always very fair. The sentiment was bipartisan. Opposition leader Kim Beasley called him distinguished, a high-caliber investigative and political journalist who became a household name. But he was an entertainer too, had been since he led a rock band, The Bitter Lemons, at university. Paul joined the ABC in 1969 and spent the first half of the 70s as a London-based foreign correspondent. And of those children, eight out of ten are at a standard below average. Then came five years at Four Corners, where one of his documentaries won a Logie. But Canberra was where he belonged. With the ABC and then with the Nine Network, he carved out a reputation as a shrewd political reporter and commentator and a tough, incisive interviewer. Is this all fair, Dinkum, or are you just politicking to try to head off a backbench revolt? Paul's most controversial story in recent years incurred the wrath of a former Prime Minister. But his trademark was humour, to make politics just a little less dry. The simpler tax system already weighs over five kilos and stands about 20 centimetres high. Paul will be missed by his wife Dorothy and children Chloe, Joel and Matthew, and by his colleagues. Laurie Oakes for Nightline. After the break, Prince Charles lends his support to Diana's favourite charity and the swastika legacy of Germany's Nazi past. A South Australian abalone diver who survived two days battling the elements says the ordeal has scarred him for life. Howard Rod was washed off his boat near Seduna on Monday. His companion, Danny Thorpe, who was too scared to leave the overturned vessel, is still missing. I shouldn't have left me, mate. I should have stayed there with him. After 18 hours in the water, with only an esky lid for support, Rod made it to land and was picked up by a motorist a day later. He now says he will never return to the sea. In a demonstration of just how far medicine has advanced, a Victorian man has become the first Australian to have a triple organ transplant. 54-year-old Merv McDonald's wife, Christine, has just given him one of her kidneys. The operation follows a heart-lung transplant nine years ago. Now a recipient of three vital organs, Merv McDonald has made medical history in this country. Following a heart and lung transplant nearly a decade ago, he developed severe kidney problems that necessitated a renal transplant. The wife really surprised me. She said that she'd donate a kidney to me. Yeah. What did that mean to you? Oh, oh you yeah. fair bit. Merv was uh, particularly fortunate because uh, 
there was someone in his life who obviously cared for him very greatly and made what is an extraordinary gift, which is the gift of a kidney. Doctors say both donor and recipient operations have been successful. It's life basically to him. In terms of the advances in medical science, I think it's again shows, shown us that we can push the frontiers. But doctors only want to push these frontiers when it's possible to improve the length and quality of a patient's life. In the early 1990s, transplanting lungs exclusively was not an option. So Mr McDonald's healthy heart was implanted into another patient, Russell Wills. Today, Mr Wills was thrilled to see his donor doing so well. He's had a long battle, a very long battle, and uh, it was great to see them smile again. Married only a couple of years ago, the couple hoped to be able to return home soon. Get out, live a life, start our honeymoon. <laughs> Belinda Byrne for Nightline. New efforts are underway to find a diplomatic solution to the Middle East crisis. Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat is in Moscow hoping to persuade President Vladimir Putin to mediate a ceasefire after two months of violence. And a border meeting between Palestinian and Israeli officials has also boosted hopes for a truce. Let the army win is the new slogan of the hardline Israeli right wing. And on the southern edge of Jerusalem last night, that army certainly seemed to be doing its utmost to comply to the request. Pouring heavy machine gun fire into the Palestinian village of Beit Jala. The severe Israeli response to shots fired by Palestinians at Gilo, a Jerusalem suburb built on occupied land, left right-wingers in a mood of vengeful jubilation. Kill the Arabs, they chanted, as they danced around an impromptu bonfire. But in reality, nobody is winning from the escalating violence. And for once, the Israeli government seems to be recognizing as much. On Monday, after a Palestinian bomb attack against a school bus in Gaza, they'd ordered massive retaliation against various Palestinian headquarters. But last night, in the wake of Wednesday's car bomb in the seaside town of Khadira, the government opted not to try to get even. But any optimism that Ehud Barak may be changing his strategy was immediately tempered last night when the embattled Prime Minister again held talks with the main right-wing leader Ariel Sharon about forming an Israeli government of national unity. Sharon, whom many blame for sparking the current conflict in the first place, is totally averse to any compromise. And it's hard to see a resolution to the two months of violence if he and his allies join a new coalition. There's still no quick end on the horizon for the U.S. election race. The Al Gore camp making it clear that if he loses, the Democrats will contest the result of the entire Florida ballot. And there's been the most obvious sign yet of just how nasty the contest has become. It's been revealed that yesterday's rowdy demonstration, which forced counting to stop in a crucial county, was a well-planned and executed ploy by George Bush's Republican Party. Are you local? Are you, are you, are you got my own She's not, and her guy is a Republican spin doctor. The votes which they successfully prevented from being counted were expected to favor Democrat Al Gore. A strange reminder of Germany's Nazi past has been discovered in a forest outside Berlin. Autumn has unveiled a giant growing swastika. The trees carefully planted in 1937 as a tribute to Hitler's Third Reich. The swastika remained undiscovered for so long because under East Germany's communist rule it was forbidden to take aerial photographs. In London, Prince Charles has paid a special public tribute to Princess Diana. Three years after Diana's death, Charles gave his support to one of her most famous charity campaigns. Prince Charles has sometimes seemed reluctant to be associated with memorials to his late former wife. Not so when it came to one of her most important legacies. At the AIDS charity where she did such groundbreaking work, he's now giving his support and praising her efforts. I know that uh, coming here today has reminded me of all of the work that, uh, that Diana did uh, uh, before she died. Um, I'm sure she'd be very pleased to know that I was here today. And, uh, Four years ago, the princess stood at the same spot, launching an appeal for a special children's unit. Today, it was opened by the Prince of Wales. Like Diana, Charles did the rounds, meeting patients and trying to give comfort. They're very warm, 
um, certainly very interested in what was happening here, and uh, uh, I got the impression that it was a genuine interest. Such a public acknowledgement of Diana's legacy is being seen here as a step forward. Prince Charles happily taking on the campaign of the woman who was abandoned by the royal family, but adored by those who she helped. Damien Ryan, reporting for Nightline. In a moment in sport, the Windies again on the ropes in the first test. League World Cup preview, and Aaron Badley back in the lead of the Australian Open golf. After the second day's play in the first test in Brisbane, Australia struggled at times against the West Indies' pace attack, but an unbeaten 62 by Brett Lee lifted the home side to a first innings lead of 250. The Windies' second dig hasn't started well, two for 25 at stumps, with Brian Lara again falling cheaply to Glenn McGrath. Day two, when one sensed the West Indies' capitulation would soon be rendered complete. Well struck, beats mid on to go all the way. But a ray of hope emerged for the tourists in the form of Marlon Black, Slater out for 54. Down and out yesterday, the Windies tore into the Australian top order. Black sending Slater, Night Watchman, Andy Bickle and number three, Justin Langer, on their way with just ten runs added. What behind? With the twins at the crease, it was clear there was still work to be done. Oh, for once, Steve says, cop that, he thrashes it through cover. Australia 4 for 148 at lunch. The visitors, though, confident the breakthrough would come. A double whammy delivered by Dylan, dismissing the wars in quick time. Sherwin Campbell, brilliant at second slip. What a good catch. That was just about past him. With Ponting gone, it was seven for 220, but Gilchrist and Brett Lee were there for the long haul. The pair adding 61 runs before the keeper skied a catch to his opposite number. McGill equally determined as the score eased past 300, Lee with an innings he won't forget. First half century in Test cricket for Brett Lee and a very, very good innings. As the Windies' predicament worsened, Lee's confidence soared. That is a very good blow. The innings ended at 332, a lead of 250. The reply, unfortunately, all too predictable. Glenn McGrath still Brian Lara's worst nightmare. Yes, he has, I'm sure. He's gone. Steve Haddon for Nightline. In the Pura Cup, Victoria looks set for victory after taking first innings points against South Australia. Matthew Innes almost single-handedly bowled South Australia out of the game, taking six for 26 as they struggle to just 96. The Vicks lead by 273 with eight wickets still in hand. To golf, and at the halfway mark of the Australian Open, teenager Aaron Badley is on track to retain his title. He shot a 69 today to share the lead with New Zealand's Greg Turner. Victorian Scott Laycock is four under, with Greg Norman among a group of big names, another stroke further back. The Shark handed over a Holden to Larry Austin, the prize for yesterday's hole-in-one. Back at the 15th today, he took two shots to nail. Nothing but a headache for Adam Scott, his putter was the cause of it. Badley's morning was beautiful. Another sub-70 round had his name on top of the leaderboard early. He's going well. Picked up three shots today, but had to save par on the last to stay in front. I'm still going to go out there and just, I'm, I'm going to try and win this golf tournament. From across the Tasman came Greg Turner, in the picture with this putt at the 16th. The Kiwi is equal leader with Baddeley at the halfway mark. Oh, he's got it. Scott Laycock put in his two bobs worth. This at the 17th caused some excitement and put him two behind the leading pair. Oh, my God. Norman's second round started with a blaze. Birdie, birdie. Very, very good pace. And how about the line? Two under after two, he looks set to make a move on day two. The A-team failed to fire, Appleby even and avoiding the cut, Allenby in the equation, sometimes stuck, he still worked his way out of tricky situations. Of the internationals, Mark O'Meara said goodbye, Nick Faldo got himself out of trouble and into contention. Looks pretty good. American Matt Kuchar couldn't find the right measure, Norman wasn't out by much at the last, but enough to deny him a slice of second spot. Leif Mulligan for Nightline. The Rugby League World Cup will be decided this weekend with Australia hot favourites against New Zealand. And it may well prove the international the winger with reports he'll leave the code next year. It could have been mistaken for a team meeting, but the kangaroos were waiting for a call from the Prime Minister. You play well, I'm quite sure you win, but if you know you don't, 
Um, we'll all still love you. Of course you will. Wendell Saylor's first cup final could also be his last league international. The world's best winger won't be eligible for next year's kangaroo tour if he heads to rugby union either in the UK or back home in 2002. Yeah, it's going to be a big finale hopefully and uh, I really want to win this World Cup. While Sailor walks the walk and talks the talk, New Zealand's Leslie Vainicolo has a much different approach. His pre-game ritual, anything but you'd expect from a player dubbed the Volcano. Read a Bible and uh, put the Bible on the jersey and so bless the jersey and I have a prayer and then I kiss the Kiwi and then put the jersey on. Organisers' fears that Trans-Tasman final wouldn't appeal to local league fans have been allayed. More than 35,000 tipped to be at Old Trafford. Chris Bombalus in Leeds for Nightline. Australia's premier trotting race, the Miracle Mile, was run at Sydney's Herald Park this evening with Holmes DG winning for the second year in a row. Pre-race favourite Shaka Maker failed to make an impression on the field. Holmes DG leading all the way to the line where at it again lunged to produce one of the closest results in the race's history. It was uh, even difficult to split the two in the photo, the judges taking several minutes to award the $400,000 purse to Holmes DG. Goran Ivanisevic has found a new way to lose a tennis match. Already clearly upset with himself in his second round match in England, Goran set about getting very upset with his rackets as well. He managed to smash every single racket in his bag, earning a couple of code violations and a penalty point. That uh, didn't really matter. He didn't have a racket left to play with, so he had to concede. And still to come on Nightline, the latest finance and the weekend weather. In finance news, the Australian share market finished the week little change. The all odds closing only a point up. In Tokyo, the Nikkei was up 14 points. In London tonight, the FT100 is 31 points up in morning trading. Gold is fetching $266.25 US an ounce. And in European trading tonight, the Australian dollar is buying 52.12 US cents, 61.8 euro cents, just under 58 yen and 37.2p. The national weather and a high is centred off the west coast of Tasmania, while there are low pressure systems over Western Australia and the Northern Territory. Old front has the forecast, a late storm in Darwin, fine in Brisbane, an early shower in Sydney, fine in Melbourne, Canberra, Hobart and Adelaide, and in Perth it should be a fine day there as well. That's the news this Friday night from all of us here at Nightline. Have a great weekend. Good night.